Yeah, I wasn't sure. I didn't know what to expect when I reached out. I was like, I don't know if they're going to want to do this. I don't know who's going to want to come on and talk to me. I was actually doing a podcast right before we went into pandemic. And then without having like the ability to draw from exper- current events and experiences, it kind of went dead. I was just really? like, well, because then I moved into doing like a daily diary on Facebook through the first okay. three months of the pandemic, just kind of logging my life and what was going on and stuff like that and um and then I just found that to be like I was getting stuck you know of like oh, I'm living the pandemic every day and so I really wanted to just like turn everything off and I did social media distancing instead and uh so yeah I mean having a podcast had been a lot of people had told me for a long time do a podcast do a podcast so um yeah and I've I've taught workshops up at HSU and stuff like that so oh what on podcasting uh no not on podcasting just like on BDSM and kink oh, and okay. stuff like that so yeah I just feel like yeah this is like no you're in your yeah you're yeah, in your yeah, own I've been you're on comfortable the radio. I've, I've I've been in the journal like I've been interviewed about this before so yeah Wow. Uh, was that what your podcast was about? Was um, what, did, what did we call it? We called it um, uh, uh, What Would Naughty Do? And it was just kind of these conversations about what it's like to do online dating. Um, I interviewed members uh, from my community just about like different kink events that we had attended and, and stuff like that. So there was a news article that had broke out that really I felt like was dragging polyamory through the mud. It broke out in like Del Norte County about there was some devious behaviors and then they're like they dropped that oh that they were like polyamorous and then it you know it builds stigma and misunderstandings and stuff like would that. Would you mind so. pulling that just a little bit closer to you? Perfect. Yeah you can tweak the mic too if you turn it. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Right. Okay, right. great. So polyamory, are you pro polyamory? Is that a weird question to ask? Are you pro or anti polyamory? <laughs> I suppose you could be either. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you're allowed to be whatever you want to be, really. Um, yes, I I am very um, love who you want to love, love as many people as you want to love, as long as it's all safe, sane, and consensual. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I'm so I've been looking forward to talking to you since I reached out. <laughs> I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So Humboldt well, fetish life. That's how I came into contact. Y- yeah, with you. What, yeah. What made you find me? I guess I'm curious. I well, do you run that? Is that your page? It is my page. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, I'm the queen, actually the princess. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend who went to a fetish life thing at Siren Song. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, I think it was pre-pandemic. Yes. Yes. We, and, we stopped right on the. Cusp. Yeah. yeah. And she was telling me about it, and I was like, Oh my god, I gotta, I gotta reach out to someone to try to get them <laughs> on because that was I couldn't find any information about when it would be coming back up. So I was like, It's been hard. It's yeah, been a hard I conversation bet. with us um, because w- we've talked about fetish night, and the thing with fetish night is. I designed it because I wanted it to be an intimate experience. I wanted you to be able to go and meet people and talk to people. And then you could also get up on stage and either work with our professional spankers or we would help like bring you and your partner up and help facilitate a spanking maybe between the two of you and show you our toys and how to use them and the safety and and all of that. And that, that required less than six feet. And, you know, we talked about it and people were like, well, just come back and like do a performance. And I was like, dude, none of us want to stand up there for like three hours and, you know, just like be on cue doing a performance. That's like a go-go dancer, maybe in a cage or, you know, at a tip top club or something like that. But that's not like our, it was all about engaging with the audience. And during this whole pandemic, we didn't feel it's safe to do that. So it's, it's been hard. We miss our people. Our people miss us. And we talked about when the numbers had came down, they reopened everything. Um, I was reaching out to my team members and, and venues and, and trying to get a feel. And, and we had a tentative date. And we thought, okay, we're going to be able to come back. And then, you know, everything, yeah, everything just changes from day to day. And so because – We pride ourselves on safety so much. Um, It's just not safe. You know, that's that's how we feel about it. So we're still waiting for the go ahead. Yeah, we're still in quarantine. (laughs) Yeah. So I have to ask what. Okay, so describe a fetish night for me because I have no idea. Like, are you is it like 
is is there sex happening? No, like what is I I mean my imagination's running wild because I have great. no idea. I get this question all the time. The first question everybody's like, is it an orgy? And yeah, I'm like, like no. what do you mean? What is okay, happening? Okay, so we're in a bar. Okay. We're in a public place. Yes. You're not allowed to have like sex yes, in that's public. That's what I was thinking. You know. Um so you would like come through the door and you would get, you know, greeted by some staff members that would take your money and, and, you know, put a wristband on you and stuff like that. And, uh, there is a stage that has, um, equipment on it. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt again. Can you pull that down just a tad, the mic stand, just pull it down slightly. Oh, okay. Perfect. That way I can see you a little bit better. Oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm in your story right now. So, um, so anyways, we have a stage, and then we have bondage equipment that's up. And so what we have is something called a St. Andrew's Cross, which is basically an X. And it's designed for you to kind of stand with your, you know, arms up and out. And, and we would, you know, uh, bind your hands to the top. And you can bind your feet to the bottom, too, and, and stuff like that. And then you're in the standing position with your back exposed and your butt exposed. And then we could spank you. We could flog you, you know, and all of and, – and you're kind of, like, up on stage. And, and then there's something that's called um, a spanking bench that maybe looks like a sawhorse. And you kind of straddle it and lay down on it. And so your ass is really like up in the air, and <laughs> and you know again we're we're spanking people and 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 playing with them and and stuff like that. And there's a DJ and there's people dancing on the dance floor. And um, we did a theme every month, so there was always costumes involved and people getting dressed up. And and it was just really fun. The the women were amazingly sexy and 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 running around in some of the sexiest outfits I've ever seen. And people really got into the costume part of it. And, and just dressing up and the bartenders always dressed up and played along with us. Oh, and, that's cool. And so, yeah, we we were really adamant about like drunk isn't sexy. And if you were overly intoxicated, you just got thrown out. And we had rules like when you came in, you have to ask before you touch and, and you know, just being mindful of people's spaces and boundaries and stuff. And, and so I think we set a precedent before people even came into the door and um for the most part people behaved we really had low incidences there you know considering you know 200 people in a night people in lingerie running around you know kind of this real high sexual energy it was safe and it was fun yeah, it seems like you definitely have to be careful with the alcohol, right? Because some people get a little, it, little out there. It's you know, it's alcohol is an interesting tool. You know, I mean, so people want to have a couple of drinks to you know relax their inhibitions. Um, sometimes what I've experienced in, in my many years of doing fetish night and other events is that people get so high on the energy around them that normally how they might feel with two drinks starts to behave like they've had four drinks. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people tend to get overly intoxicated because they're awkward and they yeah. feel uncomfortable. Especially and in that environment. I mean, if you've never gone, be. I would imagine yeah, it's you know, a little intimidating. We try to make it friendly. We try to, you know, let everybody know, like, it's okay. You know, make a friend. Talk to somebody. And everybody was super, you know, it's not like you could walk up to a woman and she'd be like, oh, don't, you know, talk to me. I think everybody was really friendly and open in that environment. So... And so is this, are the, are there people just like walking in off the street and getting up on the, the St. Andrew's cross or yeah. is it like, really? Yeah. Wow. It's great. So <laughs> my favorite thing about fetish night is someone comes in the door, right? And I, and I try to stand there and greet most of the people, um, and engage with them. And, and I can tell a newbie, I, you can sp spot oh, them a I mile bet. away, yeah. you know? And so, uh, you know, they come in they're you know, and they're like, when does someone get up on the cross? And I'm like, <laughs> whenever you're ready. Our staff is waiting. No, no, I could, I could never do that, you know. And, and you watch them, and as the night goes on, you can see them talking to their friends. You know, should I? Shouldn't I? And the friend, yeah, you should totally do that, you know. And it never fails. By the end of the night, they're on the stage. You know, they're up there on the cross. Um, whether you know, maybe it took a couple of beers or uh, a lot of nagging from their friends. I, I don't know, but yeah, I. And it's fun to watch 
the faces as they have those first time experiences. I mean, that's why I kept doing it because it was just fun to give people an opportunity to try something that's safe and, you know, exciting and, and no shame in it, you know, and stuff. No one's making fun of somebody for doing that or whatever. So yeah, it was great. Do you notice it being a lot of first timers that come in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We always kind of at the end of the night kind of sat there and went, wow, we've seen a lot of new faces this time. And we had our regulars, we had our dedicated, you know, people that came in once a month for their physical therapy, as we called it. And they said, I look forward to this every month. It, it changes my whole perspective for the month and how I feel and, and stuff like that. So um, it had, you know, some therapeutic value to it, I think, for some people. Is it, is it a purely sexual thing? Nah. No, okay. No. No, I think. Because, I mean, how do you describe it? Like, what, what is it? Because you, as you I said, I don't like, know. Like, people are getting this jumping out of an it. airplane, like riding a okay. zip line. I mean, it could be an adrenaline rush. Um, I suppose that for some people, there is dynamics that are very, you know, erotic and, and sexual about it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a sexual experience. I mean, like if you would have come to a fetish night and you would have gotten spanked by, you know, the, the toppers that we have there, they're not getting turned on by spanking you maybe necessarily I mean I'm not saying that you know some of my girls were not like dude that was hot you know <laughs> but it's you know I don't think everybody's walking around with a giant boner yeah. either you know so it's yeah it's kind of this and for each person it's different you, you know I think that it, it's definitely in the bedroom and I've been in dungeons where sex is a part of that you know it wasn't at fetish night and that's not to say that couples didn't you know have this great time at fetish night and go home and fuck I, I hope they did you know I want to encourage that behavior um but yeah I it's not always about sex I yeah. think it's it's you know there's an interesting like BDSM kind of at, it, at its core is this idea of a power exchange and a power dynamic and this ability to like for me I identify as a submissive and as a bottom and so it's this really almost this will probably sound so backwards it's a really empowering feeling to surrender power over to somebody that you trust and even as a submissive, I am in control of the whole entire scene. Nothing happens without me. I get to say yes. I get to say no. I get to say when it stops. And I, I get to negotiate all the terms of the agreement. You know what I mean? And so there's a lot of power in that, even though you may see someone who's like tied up and gagged and looks really helpless they're not, they are in complete control of that situation. And, and for people who live in a world where maybe they hold a power position in their lives and are always kind of the dominant of the household or the dominant at work and, you know, always like having to control everything, it's really relaxing almost to like just shut down and like let somebody else take over and kind of release yourself of the responsibility of things you know you just get to let go and and you know enjoy the moment so it's yeah is that what bdsm is is that yeah like bdsm play? yeah has has kind of become this four-letter term and we talk about bondage uh, domination, um, uh, sadism, and masochism. Oh, that's what it stands for. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. So, yeah. It, which is a lot of the power exchange, you mm -hmm. know. You got to have one to kind of, not that two tops can't play or two bottoms can't play with each other, but, you know, it is kind of about this this power exchange ultimately. That is so, that's, that, I mean, that sounds crazy, obviously, because I haven't, <laughs> I'm not in that world. So I'm over here like, whoa. The idea of handing over power to somebody like that seems, I don't know, you don't come across that outside of that. But we do it all the time. I mean, at some point when you walk into the doctor's office, you're kind of like handing some sort of power over to your doctor and believe that they are going to take care of you and you're going to give them enough information and that they will make decisions for you that are in your best interest. We do it as parents with our children. Um, I think at times we even do it with our domestic partners, you know, that at some point, sometimes someone has to step up and say, I'm making the de decision or, you know, I'm pulling 
selling a veto card or or whatever. It happens in, in business and finances. There's a p- power dynamic all around the world in, in all different situations. It's just interesting to take it into the to the bedroom. And a lot of people will tell me I don't have any fetishes or kinks, and then we can sit down and have a conversation. I'm starting to go, yeah, you do. Just a little, but you do. You know, I think everybody, you know, has something that turns them on. So. And so it's that power play that kind of turns into sexual energy? How does that transfer? Yeah, I mean, it, it can. I mean, not always. You can, you know, go see a professional dominatrix. Or there's people that just have, you know, uh, relationships where they're like a mentor and a mentee. And there could be a power dynamic there without, you know, sex involved as they're teaching someone else and leading them. Um, but yeah, it can, it can turn into, you know, sex. There's all kinds of fetishes around, you know, sex too and, and stuff like that. Um, you could get into, uh, something that's, uh, known as cuckolding, which is, uh, in, in common terms, most people understand it as it is a, um, a husband who likes to watch his wife have sex with another man and that he gets off on that either because of the humiliation he might experience during that, um, of the power dynamic of watching um, him not have power over even though it's consensual, the idea of like another man kind of like taking his his woman and, and watching that power dynamic. So that's a that's an example of like a sexual experience that involves a power, you know, dynamic and stuff. So, but there's lots of that is ones. so <laughs> crazy. I'm over here and I'm like, why would you want somebody else to have sex with your wife? But people like that. Yeah. And I mean, it does, I mean, crazy is subjective, right? Yeah, it is. But that's. Where do you think that stems from? Like, what? How, how did you find BDSM? Was it oh. something you kind of just stumbled into and were like, it's, oh, okay, I like this? We had this conversation the other day about how um, fetishes get born and um, I, in all, all different ways. Um, so there's a whole society out there that's all about, like, medical fetishes. And Medi- like, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Medical equipment? Yeah, medical equipment. You know, they get into... Um, oh, is that like the... the latex like people like to get dressed up in latex latex is kind of yeah another another type of fetish that's often seen in in medical fetish like photography and and stuff like that but medical fetishes usually include like um i got body casted one time from head to toe like wrapped in a body cast and then they they like tortured me and then they like cut the body cast off of me it was for it was for a photo shoot that i was doing and and stuff so there's people you know let's say maybe you know uh you go into the hospital uh you've broken your leg uh this hot nurse is in there you know helping you take care of your cast and and whatever and and maybe there is uh some transference that goes on where you find yourself attracted to the nurse because she's your care provider or whatever. And then, you know, you just go home and kind of that spins for you of like, Oh, that hot nurse in the one time. And, and pretty soon you've developed this kind of mental connection between seeing somebody maybe in a medical uniform that triggers that memory that triggered that boner that triggered that one time, you know? And so I think, For some people, that's how, you know, things develop. You know, you do something one time and, you know. It just sticks. Well, you get excited about it. And then, you know, we replay things that are exciting to us, I think, over and over in our head. Things that brought us joy or, you know, whatever. And and so it just kind of builds. And then you Google it and you're on Pornhub and there's other people doing it. And, you know, so it it grows. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. Some people may develop a fetish because of lack of something in their life, maybe. Maybe they didn't feel like they got enough of something from a former partner or whatever. And, you know, so then for, you know, that becomes, you know, that's what maybe pushes that desire to have more and more and more of something. So, I mean, fetishes are are born for all different types of reasons, but I think primarily you see something and it excites you and then you see more of it and it excites you more and, you know, pretty soon you're down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think the the punishment one is, like, so abstract to me because it seems like why would you want to be in pain when like you're having sex or like when you're like, I think it's just a concept that I'm like, what do we, what, you know what I mean? 
It's so like if you're because that's like part of the the masochism thing, right? Is like a pain. Yeah, yeah. Is the is is deriving? You know. So what about people who like play football? Like they're always getting hurt on the field, you know, and yet they get back up there and they keep playing football like over and over again, you know, or they're runners, you know, and then you've got a cramp in your leg, you know. Oh, that's, you just... I do like my favorite part of going to the gym is waking up sore the next day. Like that's a great feeling. Right. That's interesting. Okay, I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. So when so the next day when you're sore, like what are like when I wake up the next day and my ass is black and blue and every time I sit down, I'm like, oh, man, that was a good time last night. <laughs> man, that was fun. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, God, ow, that hurt. Not like when I dislocated my shoulder. That's yeah. a different, like, pain association. So, like, when you get up in the morning and your legs are sore, it was leg day, you know, and your legs are sore. Like, what are some of the things that go through your mind as you're walking around the house and you're sore? What are your thoughts? I had a killer workout yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. It felt good, yeah. huh? Yeah. Can't do wait that to again. go to <laughs> yeah, can't wait to go back tonight. Right? That is interesting. I I never thought about it that way. So, yeah. And when you're in the gym, you know, and you're pushing yourself, right? You're pushing yourself hard. Like, yeah. it hurts. And you're like, oh, but one Different more. types of pain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. Is it like, are there stages to this? Does somebody come in and normally, it like, starts out with, okay, I'm going to, you know, maybe get spanked in public. And then it goes into, okay, maybe I'll check out. You know, the latex, like, are there evolutions or do people find one and then that's kind of their go-to? Oh, I, th- I think it's a buffet. Okay. You know, I think people, you know, I, I, I feel that everybody's, like, wants, needs, and desires are as unique as their fingerprints. And how, even how much someone, you know, wants or needs, you know, something. Some, some of us are really into the spanking aspect of it. And that's like their go-to, you know, if you were on the buffet, that's the big pile on your plate, you know. And, you know, there may be some other things. There's um, like electrical play out there that some people... Like shocking? Yeah, like shocking and, oh. and stuff like that. And some people may be into that, but Maybe only a mild form of it. Like, don't get the jumper cables yeah, out. Yeah, we're not going to bring out the car battery. You know, but grab a 9 volt. You know, <laughs> it'll be fine. So um, I think everybody has boundaries and, and limits. And I think as you – I think, like, the cool thing about Fetish Night is to walk in and kind of have this idea of, like, okay, people are doing this. It feels really normal. And just to open the idea and the conversation to go home and talk with their partner and explore different things. And then you you go down the rabbit hole. You're like, well, that was really hot. What was that called? Or, you know, I really like this and I want to know more about, you know, rope bondage and learning rope and, and stuff like that. Or latex. Latex is a whole, like, fashion fetish that's out there. Um, I've met people that have spent – like a million dollars on latex stuff like suits and stuff yeah wow ha- yeah zipper hoods and and suits and you know they're just That's like crazy super into it but then there's people out there that you know spend tons of money on racing motorcycles or hot rods or or you know, alcohol or yeah right you know so it's like everybody's got a hobby of some sort like you know spend your money on something that brings you joy i guess so did starting fetish night kind of stem out of a desire to normalize the culture a little bit more yeah, I mean, I've been – so I – to circle back to one of your earlier questions that I don't think I answered was how did I find, like, kink and, and bondage and stuff like that? And um, to be revealing of my age a little bit um, back when dial-up internet existed. And um, they had chat rooms. Like, you know, chat rooms were kind of a big deal with the internet. And they had these video chat rooms that you could go into – and I was, I don't know, maybe 20 years old when I found, 19, 20 years old when I found these video chat rooms. And I kind of stumbled into uh, what would be kind of a poly swinger kind of community. And that's probably where my introduction was. I had met swingers much earlier on in my life and had always kind of been 
not a not a normal teenager growing up. I was a very wild child and like gave no fucks and and stuff like that. And so my mom is not the least bit surprised that this is my <laughs> lifestyle by any means. Um, so but so I yeah I found this chat room and and these people who were just really awesome. Most of them I probably call swingers, you know, or poly people or whatever. And I kind of just started like talking to them. And I started kind of exercising this female dominance like I had over these men. Like I could ask them to do stuff. And I realized that even at that point, I was in control of a virtual room full of people. And um, so it just kind of developed from there. And then I met more people in in other chat rooms. And then you start finding local communities. And and back then, it was way underground. You had to, like, know somebody who knew somebody who knew. And you had to get, like, invited and and stuff. And, And so it wasn't something that was just you could, you know get on Google and and be like, where's my local munch? Um, You had to like really kind of dig around and and stuff like that for it. And then like as it's become more mainstream, like Fifty Shades of Grey, what came out, you know, and that kind of, you know, brought it more into the limelight of people are like, whoa, this is like a thing. And, you know, Anne Rice wrote a whole series um, under Anne Rampling, a lot of erotica novels. And so erotica has existed, you know, for for years. Um, so anyways, it just kind of it, it developed and, and I moved to Humboldt County like 16 years ago and I found um, a group that was here um, that was called uh, Club Risque and they were a gr- group of people that were just throwing these fun sexy parties and I through a friend of a friend found out about this party and someone said this is so you you got to go to this party and so I went and met some cool people and and um went again and again and again and met more people and and then pretty soon a group of us got together and said let's throw parties and we started throwing parties and we did that for a lot of years and I threw parties and and then I just, yeah, part of, like, having fetish night was to take the dungeon, like, out of the basement, to take it, like, out of the dark and, like, throw it right up on the stage. Like, you could literally, like, walk in off the street and, bam, there'd be somebody bent over getting their ass spanked, you know, and to destigmatize that, you know, that we're not, like, I I think we're not, like, a bunch of creepy old people. Um, we're, we're moms and we're teachers and, you know, we, we all have jobs and we all have, you know, stuff to do and, and on, we like to do this for fun too. And yeah, make it normal. We're just, we're normal people. We're normal. Okay. We're weird, but. (laughs) But not in a bad way. Not in a bad way. The most interesting people are weird. Right. Like that. That I that is so crazy, and so it's because it is, it's more normalized now. I mean, mm. at least in my lifetime, I've yeah. seen kind of that progression of like, like yeah. you said, Fifty Shades of Grey, which was kind of like the first mainstream movie with that, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Well, there was one that was done with uh, who was it? Rosie O'Donnell. There was an Exit to Eden, which was an Anne Rice written book, and they they did this movie called Exit to Eden. It was awful with Rosie O'Donnell. Yeah, oh it was no! Awful. Yeah, yeah. They were like these undercover cops that like go to this island. It, it anyways. Yeah, it, yeah. If you want to watch a bad movie, it's a it's yeah. That's the book there. is way better, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, but yeah. So yeah, fifty. I think Fifty Shades of Grey was kind of like where. Every housewife was reading it, you know, it kind of, yeah, it wasn't like the erotica section in the back of Barnes yeah. and Nobles. Yeah. Where you were judged if you had to go walk through right, the curtain right, or right. something. Right, you can't yeah. look around. Like... Make sure nobody's paying attention. Like, can I go back here? Uh... Put the book inside a book while you're reading it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which I think is good. I think if you hear like sexual repression thrown around, right, right that people are like, they have these urges that, you know, maybe aren't vanilla or normal however you want to put it right and then where do they express that right i guess and so this is kind of like an outlet where you can go explore that and i think i think there's a lot of things that um certain certain people would maybe consider like wrong or deviant behavior and in this realm you can you know kind of act out all of these fantasies consensual like sit down with someone and say this is what I want to do and do you agree to like do that with me and 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 stuff like that and so it's kind of exciting to find that match of like yeah I'm willing to explore that with you you know even though maybe mainstream might find it to be really uh taboo and unacceptable 
Yeah, which is a lot of things, right? I yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think mainstream anything outside of monogamy feels taboo. Yeah, uh, for like not in our world, you know, we're like whatever monogamy is just like that's weird. <laughs> Who wants to be monogamous? You know, um, but so it's you know perception, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that there is kind of, and I, I that just comes from just this generational of, uh, you know, repression, you know, through re- religion and culture and, you know, stuff like that. So I need to live in America and be able to, you know, live this life. Yeah. Do you think that part of the rise in that, I guess, has stemmed from the rise in porn and like people are talking about sex just in general more now than they used to? Because it almost seems like sex is more... I mean, OnlyFans is... You have people making yeah insane amounts of money. Right. Yeah, I think... Or is that still kind of... It's a little more niche, and so it's still I, underground it's, a little bit. I mean, in, in my lifetime, I've watched this go from, you know, this ability of, like, being able to, you know, come out as, like, queer or trans. Like, there's been this whole... Yeah, I guess like sexual human sexuality revolution that that's all like part of that, not just and and you know, I think that that I it's hard to say like who paved the way, yeah, you know what I mean. But we're seeing like drag queens on TV and in mainstream media where that was definitely something that was you know done in only in certain clubs and stuff. And so I think we just it's it's just more socially acceptable i think in a way of maybe i don't know if that's more people just saying you know i'm here and this is who i am and you know accept it or we're in a kind of a safer space this day and age you know to to be able to go to fetish night you know what i mean and and have an event like that i don't think that would have went over very well 20 years ago yeah in the 50s it might have been a little little rougher a little rougher you know but they were having swinger parties you know they called it it's just underground yeah right it's always been that's how i feel about like drug use like it's always been around people are just less open about it back then yeah yeah and now it's like you know if you're in a certain stage you can you know possess a gram or whatever and they're like here's a ticket yeah don't do that yeah and you're (laughs) fine yeah we're growing weed there's billboards with weed i remember first time like driving through humboldt and seeing a weed billboard and i was like oh my god what is happening okay yeah so yeah yeah no so you said you were like a submissive right Mm -hmm. so is that is that constant? So every time you have sex, is it that role? Or do you – like, I don't know. Do you ever have, like, vanilla sex, I guess? Or just, like, sex that's not part of that that dynamic? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's yeah. not, like, an all or nothing thing. No, I think – I. I understand why people might perceive that, like, if you're kinky, I it's it's been interesting. Dating's hard. Dating's hard when you're like in in the poly kinky, you know, kind of world, because not everybody, you know. I I've dated vanilla people, if you know, if you we want to use that. Term. Yeah, I don't know what other term you said. Yeah, people just yeah that that aren't you know probably swimming in the deep end of the pool like I yeah. do, um, and I. It, it becomes hard because there becomes this, like, struggle of, like, they think I want this, like, thing all the time. And I'm like, no, it's fun. You know, I mean, you know, maybe you – some people like to play golf, but they don't go play golf seven days a week. You know, I mean, there's – this is a fun activity and it's great and, and stuff like that. I think – and if I was going to, like, settle down and find a primary relationship, I would probably want there to probably be an understanding of some sort of power dynamic in there because it's really where I'm comfortable and I'm at ease and, and I feel like I am at my best in, in that dynamic. Um, but uh, that doesn't have to be necessarily that someone is, like, this big, like, overbearing dom or anything like that. I think that there's just, like, negotiations that go on around a household of I'll do the dishes, you do the laundry, I cook, you clean, whatever, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so I think most of my 
kinky friends have a lot of vanilla sex you know what I mean nobody has time to like put on all that gear and get it all out and lay it all and then you have to clean it all when you're done it's a a thing it's a thing you know what I mean when we go to fetish night like we have to get out all that it takes us like an hour we're like laying out all the floggers we're like wiping all the equipment down you know it's all got to be cleaned up afterwards when you go um, there's these big events there's one in San Francisco called Surrender Uh, there's the a big one up in Portland um, called Kink Fest. And they have these dungeons that are in these giant like gymnasiums. And it takes like a week to set these dungeons up. I mean, it's an ordeal. Oh, wow. You know, so um, I mean, I have all this dungeon equipment that's like in my garage. If I wanted to play, I'd be like, okay, I need notice. Like, <laughs> let me get it all out. Let me set it, you know. <laughs> so it's, I suppose. I am not one of those people, although, God, wouldn't that be great? There are people that have a full-time dungeon in their house, you know, that probably do visit the dungeon. Maybe everything's all set up. They get to go down there, you know, a couple of days a week or whatever. But I'm going to guess they probably have vanilla sex, too, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's hard to have a kinky quickie, you know? It can be done, I suppose. You know, if you're like maybe exhibitionist, a little voyeurism, you know, you can make it work. Something you you can speed up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of what I was, I was guessing, was because I mean it is a production, right? Especially if you're using equipment or you do have a dungeon, which I'm guessing is just a room with with toys, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even if you want to tie someone up, that takes a minute. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, and if you're out and about or doing something, you're not gonna be tying people up. Yeah, I mean you can. I mean there's so there's this idea called predicament bondage. Um, which is kind of this idea of putting someone into a predicament and then asking them to do like real life tasks. Um, It would be probably most famously recognized in the movie called The Secretary. It's an older movie and it talks about this guy and, you know, his secretary and and their kind of BDSM relationship. But um, uh, in the movie, he has her uh, with uh, what I would call a spreader bar, which is a solid rod, and her hands are, like, out here, and she's cuffed. And now she's in the office, and she's stapling papers. So, cuffed with her hands with like her that? With her hands oh, tied, no. you know? So, um, you know, you can, you can kind of do some kinky stuff out in public where other people might not know what's going on. Um, You know, whether that's maybe a rope corset or something like under someone's clothing or do this predicament bondage at home where, you know, you've tied maybe one arm behind the back and now it's like, okay, now do the dishes, you know, and and stuff. Um, So uh, chastity is is kind of a whole fetish out there and that's where, you know, um, you basically lock up your genitals right so that you can't access them and so you don't know who's walking down the street with you know their cock in a cage and the woman's you know walking that with is the such key. a crazy thought i've yeah. never thought about that never thought about that you know you don't know what your neighbor does yeah. when he's out checking that the mail a, that's a great point <laughs> yeah you don't know what your boss does right yeah so wow yeah, there's I mean, it's just a, it's just a culture, right? Like anything else. Yeah. Now they have these um like vibrators that are like Bluetooth controlled, so you oh, can like dangerous. send your girlfriend to work like she's with just a, out and about. Yeah, and you're just like buzz, <laughs> but oh, no. you know. So yeah, it's it's taken kind of kink and fun to you know a whole new level or or whatever. So yeah. Is it hard having that conversation when you first start seeing somebody and you guys are dating and you're like, okay, like I want to kind of go do this and, and have it be this way? Yeah, I think the biggest, like, so now we're in this world of online dating, especially even more because we're in a pandemic right now. You know, I'm not at the bar. I'm not at Fetish Night talking to people. Yeah. And it's a little different if you meet me at Fetish Night, you you know you know you're like what it is yeah Yeah. you're like you're here i'm like i thought this was vanilla what are we yeah so um you know that kind of takes it you know that's the icebreaker um with online dating um i know myself and and several of the other women in my community we don't let the cat out of the bag for a while because it my personal experience and everybody's experience is different and I think my girls would probably agree with me our experience is is if you tell somebody that you're kinky too early on it flips the dynamic of a conversation and it's this oh so let's have a threesome oh you want to do and 
yes, we're all kinky, but kinky is like a, such a small personality, part of my personality. You know what I mean? I'm, I've sat on the board of directors of nonprofits and I like to bake. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love to garden. Um, I have dogs. Um, all of these like other things were, were these huge dynamic people. And when people who aren't really inundated in our world find out that you're kinky, I get the genuine curiosity of it, and it's easy for us to recognize someone who's asking really good, genuine curiosity questions like you are. I feel like this is a great dynamic. Like, you're really curious, and I love that, and I want to talk about who we are and what we do, but when it becomes this, like... All-consuming thing, like, there's no... Yeah, and, like, they just want to put a bunch of shit in their spank bank, you know, for them to relate to later. It's 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 no fun. It, bec- it kind of becomes... It's, it's sleazy. It's mm-hmm. just sleazy. And so for most of us, we try, you know, there's a whole website out there called FetLife that's like the kinky Facebook. And it's where you can build a profile that talks all about your fetishes. You can post pictures. You can put up naked pictures. It's totally okay. You can, you know, say exactly what you're looking for and and likes and dislikes and, and all of that. So those are the the playgrounds to go and have those conversations because that's the you know the dynamic that's built there but when you're on other you know vanilla dating sites you know I it's we just don't talk about it you know I mean I think sometimes in our profiles there's like an undertone that if you were part of our world you You would pick up on Mm -hmm. it but the normal person might not you know i talk about sometimes in my profiles that i'm like non-monogamous you know and and sometimes people know what that is or um we say i'm a sapiosexual which means i'm really turned on by intelligence and so, um, and then there's like demisexuals, which we have a lot of those in our community. And that talks about like, I don't become sexually attracted to somebody until I've actually like met them and like spent some time with them. It's not the look across the room and yeah, that guy, you know, kind of a thing, you know. So yeah, we just, some of us keep it a little bit more under wrap. If you Google me, <laughs> you're going to find out all my secrets. You know, uh, you're going to find me linked to Fetish Night or other articles and, and, and stuff like that. So it's not like I'm really super hiding it. But I do like to kind of wait and, you know, before you're like, I've been chatting with a couple of guys and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go do this podcast, you know. And they're like, what are you going to go talk about? And I was like, sex positivity. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Which is important. I yeah. could see, how, though, like, especially me not being in that community. Like, I could see how you talking to somebody and bringing it up for the first time like that, that would be the focus. Right. And then it changes that dynamic of, okay, there was this person in front of me who's dynamic and multifaceted. And now it's just all consumed by, okay, what, so sexual, like what? Like, what are we, what does this mean for right. us? Like, what, it's all about that now. Just because right. it's still, it's more popularized now, but it is still so niche that right. it's like that becomes your identity instead of a part of a part of you yeah it i my i compare it all the time to like because i've been like an educator and um i consider myself like this ambassador and i kind of i run an online community and part of my um, unofficial official jobs are like weeding out people and then reminding people of like rules and boundaries and stuff like that and so I always compare sometimes being a kinkster to like being a doctor like the minute you tell somebody you're a doctor they like want to pull their pants down and they're like look at this rash can you tell me what's can wrong you, tell, yeah. you know and the doc- they're like go see a doctor you know what I mean and so sometimes when you tell people that you know I like I'm a BDSM educator or whatever they just start like vomiting all of this like and I'm like I didn't need to know that <laughs> like I didn't ask you for that information so yeah oversharing mm-hmm. y- you know and I get it. People, you know, people get excited. It's new and it's, you know, for us, like when you've been in this world, it's just like a porn star. You know, I have I have a lot of friends that do porn. It's another day at the office. Yeah. And if you've ever watched what goes on behind porn, like behind the scenes or even in the fetish models, it's not sexy. There's nothing sexy going on. It's not hot. You know what I mean? It's a lot of like, hold on, wait a minute. I need a new battery. Wait, wait, that, you know, hold on, let me get something else, you know. Um, 
it's a job. Yeah. It's, it's another day at, at the office. And so sometimes I feel like when I get into these conversations with people, it can feel very clinical at times because I'm just like, fact, 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 you know, instead of just having this really nice, you know, I feel like I'm constantly educating people and wanting to shake them a lot, you know, of like, that's not true. Stop watching porn um, and, and stuff. So it's, it's being kink. It's, oh. It can be lonely, it can be fun, it can be exciting, but, you know, at times we feel really isolated for who we are and and stuff like that. And fetish, we're, we become fetishized too, you know, of like, oh, you're kinky and now I'm attracted to you because you're kinky, not because I'm kinky with you. So, it's complicated. And it seems like it'd be hard to set that boundary, like you said, right? Where if you say, oh, I like to be submissive and then they go okay let's have a three-way it's like right. oh well that's not right. that's not the same right path that's, yeah right? so i get to choke you i'm like do you even know how to choke somebody and you do, do you understand how like mm, no you can't choke me are you trained i'm always like tell me your credentials <laughs> send me your resume <laughs> give me your references so yeah yeah that's gotta be it's gotta be hard right especially where you are so open about it which is great yeah but then there's the flip side of that right and then yeah. everybody knows that and then that's your branding right. in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it's a double edged sword. You know, it's 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 hard when you're, you know, out and yeah. I mean and I don't mind like in my community, I I get a lot of questions from my community members and stuff and 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 whatnot. And um, I'm up here. Humble County is really small. You know, it's not like living in San Francisco or being in Portland or even in L.A. You know, so like up here in Humboldt County, I might be considered one of the more knowledgeable people. You put me in San Francisco and I'm like a nobody down there, you know. But I go to these events and then I take all the information that I've learned from, you know, going to these other universities and bring that back here to my community to try to teach them because it's not easy for everybody to travel. These events aren't cheap, you know, and stuff. And so, um, you know, here I'm kind of the princess and in other, you know, worlds I go to other places and I'm just like, oh my God, you are like, the coolest shit you know i get to meet these really insane famous people you know and so i don't mind being here in the community and having someone you know when we're at a party or whatever i taught you know i've taught electrical play and and taught people how to play with fire and um you know and it's nothing like i don't get into the classes that i've taken but i can teach some basics you know i can teach some basics how to tie up some cock and balls and like not hurt anybody and some basic rope skills and you know i i know enough to give everybody a little bit of like here put your toe in the pool you know enough to get you started yeah and have fun and hope that that they take that and go, this really excites me and I want to know more. And the internet is endless. You can find out anything you want to know out there. So these classes that you've learned and that you've taught, are they online? Are they in person? Yeah. Well, so there's there's actually a whole Kink Academy. What is it? Kink Academy? Kink University? Kink University. I'm going to go with Kink University. I haven't been there in a while. Um, but they actually have – you can subscribe. Uh, they have some free classes, and they're all taught by some amazing humans. Um, some of them I've had the the honor of meeting and stuff like that. And so you can take classes, and it's like they do them in like a succession of like 101, 102, 103, you know, first kind of safety and then techniques and, you know, more information. So, yeah, you can take online classes. Um, there's all kinds of books. Uh, there's a pair of uh, guys called Two Naughty Boys, and it's K-N-O-T-T-Y, like tying a knot two naughty boys they have all kinds of instructional youtube videos out there on um, bondage and how to tie people up and books and you know so the their information's out there there's books on the safety um i have a small book that's like emergencies in the dungeon um great title right <laughs> and it happens shit happens man you are you are doing some dangerous shit and stuff goes wrong like this is a really you know i mean it's 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 like those people that are you know are like tied up in handcuffs or whatever and the saws like coming down at their head you know you're like oh my god there this is like a serious thing like the safety is really really important someone is tied up and cannot save themselves essentially and has really put them into your hands and turned control over to you that's a huge responsibility you have to know that when you're tying rope that you're not tying off a nerve that people don't even know until you go to untie them and then they're like my arm doesn't work anymore and you're like mm, 
hmm, whoops, you know, and, and injuries, just injuries happen. We've, we've, I think all of my friends at one point in time have experienced some sort of injury in, in the dungeon, never like an intentional thing, but accidents just have accidents happen in vanilla sex. Have you seen that show? Sex sent me to the ER. It's hilarious. So, I mean, you know, um, but yes, so we have this uh, little guidebook of like, you know, uh, dungeon emergencies and, and stuff like that. And there's all kinds of, you can, what do you want to learn? I mean, it's just like, what do you want to know? It's out there. You can find it. That's so incredible about today's day and age is that you, with anything. Yeah. You want to learn how to Google it. <laughs> be a photographer. It's yeah. online. Yeah. You want to learn how to get into BDSM. It's online. Yeah. That's cool that they teach classes. I, I didn't think that there would have been that much. I mean, obviously, because I don't know anything, but I would have thought that there's, you know, a knot tying class where you don't tie off somebody's vein. Like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Right. I yeah. just busted out a knot and been like, okay, well, right. I think that's fine. Right. But there's there's that underlying, and all that comes from people talking about it, right? Because how many other people wouldn't have known that, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, rope rope and like breath play and you know fire play. These are all really really dangerous things. Breath like, play, breath play, like, like breathing on somebody. Yeah, yeah. Well, like cutting off someone's breath. Oh, you oh know? I was thinking like blowing air on. Okay, yeah. Well, in COVID day and ages, that's, that's really death dangerous. Play too. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Our, our test results have grown over the years. We're, we're, um, I've, I've taught, uh, worked in some workshops and, and tried to destigmatize um, sex, sexually transmitted infections. And um, it's, it's kind of funny as, as we've come into COVID, you no longer just get someone's like STI results. It comes with a COVID test now, too. Like, does it really? And I'm just like, wow, yeah, times are changing, man. Different day and age. New, new test results. So, um, yeah, so everything, yeah, danger, a breath play, you know, someone can pass out. You can, you know, collapse someone's esophagus or something if you're choking them incorrectly or or whatever, you know, people pass out, um, you know, stuff like that. So you got to know what you're doing, yeah. you know, and so, I mean, there are... There are people that have been teaching kink for years that will flat tell you, don't ever do breath play. Just don't. It's dangerous. People get hurt. People die from it, you know. Um, and uh, I'm not like a big, big like go out and do breath play, you know. I'm big about like you better know what you're doing. Like you need to really research this. And I don't see that breath play is something that I would recommend that you could watch a YouTube video and really understand what's going on. And there's safer ways to do breath play than like choking somebody. Please don't choke people. Just don't. I mean, there's there's other ways. Um, uh, you can buy a gas mask and you can like cap the end of the gas mask off and then, you know, it's like hard to breathe, you know. So you can do breath play like that and then, you know, open it back up and, and let someone breathe again. Um, a lot of kink is about the assumption maybe that something is happening when it's really not so like that air of danger that's not quite there yeah so there's kind of this funny scene that so you have your submissive and he's like tied up maybe in a chair and he's blindfolded and you guys are in the kitchen and you start frying bacon you know, and he can like smell the bacon and he can hear the sizzling of the bacon. And, and, you know, maybe I'm telling him, if you make a fucking sound, dude, I'm going to throw fucking hot grease on you, you know. And he's like trying to be like really super quiet. If you take ice cold water and flick it at them, they will actually have a reaction as if hot grease has been flicked at them. And it is hilarious to watch. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like a lot of kink can be about, it's it's about a mind fuck. It's about mind fuckery, you mm -hmm. know. And it, so it doesn't have to be, it's the perception of danger more so, you know, taking a dull knife that's not actually going to hurt somebody, maybe while doing knife play. You know, but yeah, be safe. Yeah. Be sane about it, you know, but. That's a big thing, right? Like there, I've talked to a lot of people who have like rape fantasies, which is mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. So me personally, I try not to use the term rape because it's a trigger word. Okay. And what would you say? Uh, well, and I just want to bring up the point. Rape is never consensual. So that's, yes, yeah. yes. Obviously there's, yeah. So, what I'm talking but about I understand that this has been a common term. Um, and there's been big debate within my own community, um, about the term I prefer to use. I prefer to use the term ravish 
to ravish, ravish. somebody. Um, and uh, abduction, you know, kind of plays a role in that, um, you know, or the intruder scene. You hear a lot about, you know, I want someone to come into my house and break into my house in the middle of the night and, and ravish me. There are people out there that, that believe the term ravish belongs more to the concept and idea around primal play. It's funny how every group kind of has their little nitpicks about terms and yeah. vocabulary and, you know, you get the Chevy guys and the Ford guys together and it's like a nightmare and and stuff like that and the pot growers here are like Mah. you know it's it and kink community is no different people you can't call it that and yeah but that's what we want to call it you know people love to nitpick at that stuff they do they do so yeah so I have definitely encouraged my people to try to avoid using you know the rape fantasy but but more of a, a ravish fantasy and that's just that power control again that's back to that power dynamic of like I want to give up control to somebody and feel like I have no sense of control in a situation and it's a real common fantasy it is mm -hmm. which I didn't realize um but it seems like it seems like some of these can get dangerous right yes. like that seems a little yeah little sketchy right and then you have the one where like people hang themselves and jack off that's yeah. that's another one that seems a little erotic asphyxiation that's what it's called yeah auto erotic Asphyxiation. Yeah. So you're asphyxiating yourself. Why? Giving See, some of those sound like they could get. And a it's little... dangerous. People yeah. die. You know, they're they're often labeled as an unintentional suicide. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. And coroner's not gonna like write auto of you know erotic asphyxiation. Yeah. In an yeah. You wouldn't want that on your death certificate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and usually you know yeah so uh, unintentional suicide sure yeah, yeah dangerous it like yeah it seems like you gotta. I don't know. How would you not? Like, it seems like there's levels, right? And you just need to be careful because it could go sideways. Yeah, well, and that's, you know. Well, that stems from education, too, though, right? Well, right. But, it, you know, there's also kind of that, that darker side, I guess, of kink that, you know, we don't always want to talk about. But this idea of, like, chasing a dragon, which is a term that I use as a drug addict, um, you know, of this, like, you, you want to chase that high, and it's got to be more and more and more, and whether you're an adrenaline junkie, you got to jump higher and higher yeah. and farther and, and farther. And then it ends badly. That's right. the only way it can end. Right, and and, and fetishes can, can get that way, too, that people become so fixated and so obsessed on an, on an idea. And I, um, I have a friend of mine, and, and he's been into self-bondage for a really long time, and, and he talked about like freezing the keys to a padlock in, in an ice cube and then locking himself all up and you know you have to wait for the ice cube to melt to get to the keys to like unlock yourself you know or would you know his girlfriend would come home and find him all like locked up and everything and you know gotta unlock him again you know and because he'd knock the key off the shelf <laughs> behind the you know whatever oh, stuck there for a few hours yeah I yeah, guess I'm here you know, just a little bit longer yeah. you know and they're in my schedule today right when my friends uh, do uh, bondage so I have some friends down in San Francisco they've got a pit in the ground like it's in the deck it's a cement pit and uh, they also have a basement and stuff like that where they put people in cages and, and people like want to be left there like overnight and stuff. But there's cameras and like someone's up all night like watching them all night long and everybody takes a shift, you know, it's, and, and stuff like that. Because it is dangerous. You don't want to leave a human locked in a cage unattended. You want them to believe that they are unattended and like left alone because that is the thrill maybe for them. But, you know, we're keeping an eye on them. It's and, like the smoke and mirrors thing. Yeah. Yeah. Does that I like that term chasing the dragon. I think that's fitting. Does that is that pretty common? Uh yeah, I think, you know, when I first started out, I was like, oh, swingers. Oh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And then, you know, all of a sudden I'm like in San Francisco and I'm like doing these photo shoots and, you know, it's 37 buckles. I've got somebody into a chair and, you know. We're... Buckles like belts? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There's this great famous, super famous. Um, so I did some work with a, with a, a website called SeriousBondage.com. You should go check them out. They're great. Um, and there's like this famous bondage chair that, that they built and it's got like 
all I mean it's you just ankles like you're stuck and it almost looks like an electric chair you know it's got the really high back but it straps your head in your chest in your arms are down and and like you know throw a hood over somebody like you're there you're you're oh, not man. getting out of that you know and then you can fuck with people you're like I'm gonna pinch your nipples or I'm gonna tickle you or you know I'm gonna you know put my finger up your nose and you know whatever you want to do to people you know we're just leave them there so that they think that they're left there but never leave anybody unattended yeah. don't ever leave anybody unattended never ever ever I got left in a cage once <laughs> for how long um, well luckily I was at a public party when it happened but I was in the middle of a scene uh, with somebody and, and so they put me in this cage and, and we were like having this dynamic and it was fun and um, his girlfriend got mad because he was engaged in a scene with me. That was their negotiation or and, and something went south for them right there. And and so he like left me to go tend to his girlfriend. Um, I th- don't think he was like really thinking it through in the moment. I'm not mad at him or angry. It wasn't like a bad scene for me. Um, but uh, I think he thought that he was going to go and like tell her something and that he would come right back to me, but he didn't. And I was in a cage and, you know, kind of sitting there, you know, and, and you get into this place that's known as like subspace or top space. It's like a runner's high maybe. Mm. And so I'm just kind of like in the subspace. I'm like, do, 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 like in this cage. And finally, like my little friend comes by and he's like, naughty. I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you want to come out? And I was like, yeah, I don't think he's coming back for me. Like, yeah, could you please, like, let me out of the cage? And, you know, so he unlocked the cage and, like, let me out. But I was like, huh, yeah, I totally got left in a cage. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of people can say that. Don't do that. I dislocated my shoulder uh, beating somebody at Fetish Night. Oh, my God. Uh, Chris will love this. So this is for you, babe. Um, he actually happens to be an EMT, so it worked out really good. Oh, that's, yeah, you got to have yeah. those guys around. Yeah, so he was like, yeah, f- f- I don't. Normally at Fetish Night, I'm not really there topping people too much because I have other business to... What is topping? Like spanking people, okay, okay. being the dom or whatever. Um, so Because normally I'm pl- I'm playing hostess. I'm like running around making sure everybody's having a good time and yeah. you know, cleaning up stuff. Making and the rounds. Yeah, yeah. I, I have work to do. So it's it's very rare that I get the opportunity to actually like flog people on stage. And and so um, he had asked me to flog him. And um, I, was, I was throwing a flogger. It was very heavy. It's made of um, elk hide. Um, so it's super heavy, dense flogger. And I threw it and it just pulled my shoulder like right out of socket. And I just kind of like walked over. I dropped the flogger. I walked over and I was like... I'd really like to continue to like spank you, but my shoulder is dislocated right now. Oh and so my god! I'm gonna have to call this scene, you know. And I, I just need a quick five. I gotta go pop yeah, this yeah, thing back on, in. Yeah, hold on. yeah. And so I, I flagged my one of my other workers, and I was like, "Can you, you know, get him down?" And he's like, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "No, I think it's dislocated." And he's like, "Hold on, let me set your arm." And yeah, so he totally like oh, <laughs> man. put my arm back into socket, and I was like, "Okay, I think you know, I think I'm okay. done for the night." Yeah, you maybe know? take it. Easy. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm gonna take the rest of the night wow. off. Wow, yeah. were you freaked out at all when you were stuck in the cage? Like, w- w- no, I mean, I, I think just, I'd be like, uh, I, we have had a problem. I been alone in a room, I might have been freaked out, but I, it was a New Year's Eve party. Okay, so, there so people was, like, were in there and was out. People everywhere around. that didn't change the fact how I felt abandoned. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and that you know, all of a sudden, you kind of have this realization of like, whoa, they're like never coming back. Like, okay. Okay, now I need to, like, I guess I need to get out of here, you know? And I I imagine that when Captain walked by and seen me, he saw the look on my face and was like, Naughty, <laughs> I think you, you, are you okay? Do you need to come out, you know? So it's it's really important that, you know, we, we check. And I could have, so we have safety words in, in, in the scene. We use them at Fetish Night. The, the most common ones are are red, yellow, and green. And and so when someone says, like, yellow, that's an indication that, hey, we need to, like, check in. We need to slow down. Uh, you know, we need to make some adjustments or whatever. If someone says, ye- like, red, everything stops. I mean, stops. And for those of us who are, like, in the scene, if you hear someone say red, your head will, like, spin around and be like, where is it? What's going on? So being in this cage, locked up, I could have at any point just said red and all eyes would have spun around and someone would have snatched me out of the cage and it wasn't, I wasn't in any harm's way, you know. I think I just sat there for a really long time going, 
Is he going to come back? Yeah. What's going on? Are <laughs> What's we done? What's going on? Are we, is this over? Usually we like say it's over. <laughs> I just got ghosted. <laughs> In a cage. In a cage. Yeah. You know, at a party. So, yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm not, that's not a, unfortunately it's my story isn't unique i mean i've heard other stories of like people like being put you know tied up and someone walking out of a room to do something and this idea of like they're just gonna like be right back and never you know and so back to that like illusion i can tie someone up i can put a hood over their head maybe i'm walking around the house in high heels so clickety clack clickety clack clickety clack I can walk down the hallway, take my high heels off, slip on some socks, and they can't hear me anymore. And they think I'm gone. I can walk all the way to the door and, like, shut the door and make them think I've left the house altogether and that they're, like, stuck. Like, what are they going to do? And and be standing right there and them, like, not knowing it. So the illusion of danger and stuff is really a lot of it. Don't leave people alone. Don't leave people alone. <laughs> Biggest takeaway from the podcast today. Don't, do not leave people don't alone. Don't leave people alone. <laughs> yeah. Especially in compromising positions yes, like that. Yeah. It's just not nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not nice. Not negotiate. definitely not ideal. Yeah. Negotiate. Yeah. Make them think they're alone. That's okay. It's okay if they think they're alone. You know. I'm sure you have some horror stories of people being left like that. Because I'd imagine... I mean, people, babies have died being left in cars. I'd imagine people have. Yeah, there was like a news article and, you know, I can't, I can't cite the source. Um, But I remember that there was like a news article that read where they had like found somebody like locked up in like a cage. And I'm going to, I'm going to guess that it was probably some sort of self bondage and they couldn't get to the key or they had set it up maybe for, it's really dangerous to play with people that you don't know. It's very possible that they could have negotiated a scene with somebody and said, I'm going to lock myself up and, you know, at 1245, you're going to come over and let me out. And that person didn't come and do their end of the deal, you know. So, uh, yeah, self, self-bondage self is, is dangerous. People do it. It's dangerous. I wouldn't do it. You know, I've had people ask me to like, can you take me out in the woods and like strip me down naked and then like tie me to a tree and then like walk off and leave me there? And I'm like, sure, we can make believe that I left you there. You don't need to know. But yeah, I'll bring my book. I'll just sit and run here. Right, I'll just, okay. yeah, hop over the stump or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's, that's somebody's fantasy. Yeah. You know. And so we want to, we want to, you know, do our best to, I guess, give people what they want, what they need, safe, sane, and consensual. When you see somebody who, who seems like they're slipping and they're going a little too deep, too fast, is there like a way you can try to like pull them back in or at least slow them down and ease them into it? Like if somebody's chasing the dragon and they're going deep and you say, okay, like this isn't sustainable or good for you. You can I try to have that conversation, um, you know, I, I can, as a top, you know, uh, refuse to do those things. No, that doesn't sound safe to me. No, I'm not willing to do that for you. This is what I can do for you. It's a negotiation. That's why it's important to do it with somebody you know. Yeah, okay. and negotiate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and understand. And it's like, so we talked about early, like, as being, like, the submissive and being the bottom of, like, having control over the scene. And I get to say red, and I get to say when the scene's over. The top can call the scene, too. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, I have been in that position where I've been beating on somebody and felt that I was hitting them way too hard. And that they might not really be in the mind space at that moment to understand that I could be really hurting them, in essence. And I've called the scene. And I've said, okay, you've had enough. I'm not going to, you know, do this anymore. We're yeah. done. We're going to, you know, call the scene. So it goes, yeah, I mean, because there's this interesting dynamic in a in a submissive's personality that I've seen in, in this fear of, like, not wanting to call a scene, like, not wanting to say red out of fear of, like, disappointing the dom. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, And I just want, you know, I want to do everything he wants me to do. I want to please him. I want to make him happy and and stuff. And, and, um, you know, a a sadistic dom will allow that to happen. 
um, if they're not a good, you know, you can be sadistic and be safe, but there's some unsafe sadistic doms out there that will just push somebody beyond their limits and because they get off on that. And, it, you know, they're not safe people. I wouldn't recommend playing with them and, unless you're maybe super experienced. And even then, I just don't think it's good to play with dangerous people. But, um, you know, so it's really important because they are in my possession they're in my hands I have to know when enough is enough for my bottom I have to know when their skin is starting to break and can no longer take anymore you know it's my job to not because it, a lot of times they don't want to you know call red and say enough is enough and end and, the and scene and so it's really important that that we take on that responsibility to protect the people that we're you know working on and stuff like that i don't want to hurt anybody yeah. you know and checking in we check in often how are you? How does that feel on a scale of 1 to 10? What does that feel like? You have to learn to read body language and you have to learn to read people's skin even, you know. I can tell when skin is about ready to bleed, you know, and no, okay, that spot's done, you know. We don't want to hit that spot anymore, you know. And you can tell by the way a person flinches and, and moves and wiggles if it feels good or not, you know, or when they've, they're getting really close to that, that pain threshold that they have, you know, and you don't want it. A lot of times people get into, you know, kink and they, they play with people for the very first time that can leave a really bad taste in their mouth. And I don't ever, that breaks my heart because kink can be so fun and so safe and such a loving space that it's horrible that the first time you play, you get hurt or injured. And, you know, it's like taking someone to your favorite restaurant and them getting food poisoning. Yeah, not a good selling point. <laughs> yeah, you're like, but, you know, so I, I want people to be safe. I want it to be enjoyable. I want it to be fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I think <clears throat> people think kink is very serious. And, you know, there's all these men and they're in leather, <laughs> you know, and they're vests and they have patches. And, you know, and then there's like me in the dungeon and I'm in like bright pink and I'm like jumping around and I'm like laughing at people, making fun of people and, and, you know, poking at people and, and, um, you know, they're, yeah. And, and so like kink doesn't have to be serious. Kink can be fun. It can be lots of fun, you know, and I think it's fun to, to laugh and enjoy the experience and, and, and have fun with it, too. Well, and I think that's why it's good that there's a community like yours out there where, you know, you guys are an open resource to people that are interested. Right. I think that's that's a good selling point. Yeah. If nothing else. You you said you use drugs. You used to use drugs. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I'm did a recovering that... addict. OK. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, did that kind of go hand in hand with. Is there like heavy drug use in the kink or not heavy drug use, but drug use in the kink community? Is that? Um, sure. I mean, there's drug use in every community. It's a great response. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's not, um, yeah. Yeah. People use drugs. There's a, there's a term called, um, PNP party and play, um, that gets, uh, used and it's this idea of like, let's do drugs and you know, fuck it's, it's, it's it's dangerous it can be dangerous um to be intoxicated um you know and stuff like that you gotta know your drug you gotta know your dealer you gotta know your dose um but sure i mean just like if you go into like most dungeons are like don't serve alcohol or anything like that and really want you to be sober mm -hmm. um you know and stuff and then and then we you know you get into the question of like well what's considered a drug you know what if you're on you know prescribed medication and you know does pot count you know and, and stuff like that and so it's just about uh you know part of the negotiation and questions is asking people you know what have you used when was the last time you used um you know stuff like that but yeah drugs of course yeah yeah they're pretty prevalent everywhere yeah yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter where you go is it hard where you are trying to recover with that with just drugs i mean especially here where there's pot everywhere no i mean no, I mean, so like, like I'm a, like my drug of choice was meth and I haven't done okay. meth in years, you know? And so it's not like if you go, 
you know, to these parties or whatever necessarily that there's a lot of, like, open drug use, mm -hmm. you know. If anything, I'm going to say the primary drugs of choice at, at probably parties are going to be probably cocaine and molly. Just yeah, I would have guessed on the Yeah, you know, there, yeah. ecstasy or, or something like that, which, you know, I, I, in low doses, you know, party on people. I'm not, I'm not promoting drug use. <laughs> God. Disclaimer. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But whatever. Everybody's on drugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some food. Yeah. For yeah, some people. Yeah, I mean. I mean, whatever. It's my got their my mind. personal experience is I'd rather have someone like doing cocaine than doing straight shots of whiskey. I mean, in me like having to navigate and manage personalities at events, the people that are drunk are the most dangerous. Is that what you've noticed, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'd, I, yeah, I'd much rather have someone on Molly that's just like, I just want to pet you and you feel like really good and squishy and do you want to snuggle and will you spank me? You know? Then like some drunk guys is like, can I grab your ass? <laughs> You know? Yeah, that's a good point. I, we were at a party one time, and these people, oh, God, they were drunk. They were just drunk, and it was the end of the night. We were, like, cleaning up, and this guy, like, grabs a baseball bat, and he's, like, swinging it at this other person and hitting them in the ass with it. And, like, the horror of my face of, like, oh, my God, he's going to, like, you know, I have to walk over and, like, take the baseball bat away. And I'm like, okay, first of all, you guys are so intoxicated that you don't know how hard you're hitting them. And they don't know how hard they're being hit. And, and we talk about, like... The ability to consent when intoxication, you know, occurs and stuff. And that's a whole uh, argument that, you know, we all have in the community and, and we all want to believe that we're all ethical and, and sober and we consent. And, and there is consensual, there's a term called consensual non-consent. And that would be under the agreement that you and I would negotiate that we are going to have this consensual um, thing that includes me getting drunk. And we've negotiated it while I'm sober or we have this, uh, we're, we are now consenting that we are both going to eat ecstasy and do these things. But we are of sound mind and body. And so um, when we talked about like even uh, like ravish play and stuff like that, that borders on the consensual non-consent. You know that I am consenting now and and this is the way, you know, it's, it's going to go down. So, um, you know, it, it becomes like... I think the California colleges, you know, have d d decided in, you know, their wording and stuff. And, you know, someone will probably call me out on this that I said it wrong and that's okay. Um, but that if you're under any intoxicant, you can't consent, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah. 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 So then that becomes like, okay, but what? What does that mean? That's a, to me, that feels like a very generic term and i understand the reason why it's written that way and in the idea that it, it's supposed to provide a layer of safety and protection but what does that really mean is that one beer you know you can't consent two beers you, you know at least like with with drunk driving we we have this 0.08 guideline you know what i mean like how many joints can you smoke and a lot of people would say man i can smoke a lot of a pot and still drive and still feel like I can make these consensual decisions. So <clears throat> drugs and play, it happens, you know. I just hope that everybody, you know, is having that negotiation. They know who they're playing with and they're being safe, sane, and consensual about it, you know. Yeah, it's a hard line to walk yeah. when you start getting into that discussion because who who draws the line and well, where and it's it's to, to me it seems personal like yeah, i might between the parties involved yeah there are people out there that i've said i won't play with you you're too intoxicated um there were events uh you know in which i was using and you know i said i won't play with you i'm too intoxicated you know and so it go it goes both ways like i have a responsibility to look at someone and go dude i'm super fucking high right now like i don't I don't, I'm afraid if I hit you, my aim would be off and I would end up hurting you. So I don't, I don't want to play, you know, you can wait till I'm sober or, you know, we can schedule a play date in the future, you know, where, you know, I'm not intoxicated. So it's, it's a lot of responsibility. You know, there are people that, are, that have been, I've seen play that I've been like, Ooh, hmm, they're a little, a little intoxicated, oh. you know, I don't know if I would have, uh, you know, I don't know that I would play with them. And, and I've had the balls to walk up to somebody and like stop a scene and be like, your person looks really fucking intoxicated. Do you really have consent for this? You know, and 
I have no qualms about interrupting a scene. It, it in 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 larger communities and bigger dungeons, you know, people are like, "Don't interrupt their scene." We have safe words and stuff like that. But I've heard stories of people saying, "I wish someone would have interrupted the scene. I wish somebody would have checked in," you know. So it's you know we have this safety to kind of like watch out for each other and, and make sure that everybody you know is okay so yeah I, I if I see something that looks unsafe or whatever I'll walk up and stop it sometimes I try to make it safe you know if I if I'm watching people play and I'm seeing somebody hit somebody and they're hitting them wrong I'll walk up and be can, can I show you a better way to do this a safer way can I can I tell you what you're doing wrong and why it can you're hitting this person in the kidneys first of all like let's stop that um you know and let me show you a better way we were we were in a dungeon one time someone was flogging someone's shoulders and they just kept hitting their neck and we watched it and we watched it and I was like all right we got to do something and you know I grabbed a towel and I just like threw a towel over someone's neck and I was like all right carry on now you're safe you know I don't want to you know I really don't want people to stop playing, but you don't want them getting hurt. At the same time. Hurt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's gotta be safe. Safety. That's good. I think that's that's important that like someone like you is out there, like just checking in. Just you checking know? in. You yeah. okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, because you don't want people getting hurt. Right. That's not good. Yeah. You don't want people getting hurt in anything. Well, and it's not just a physical harm. You know, there's emotional and mental harm that goes with this. You know, people are covered in what I call emotional landmines. You know, people get triggered. I got I got triggered once. I had a bad experience um, many, many years ago with, with metal handcuffs that I had kind of just forgotten about, that I'd had this experience with handcuffs. And um, I was doing a scene with somebody, and they got off – out some metal handcuffs and put them on me and who man I was triggered you know and it was like get these off get them off right now this is you know what I mean and 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 to be the person on the other side you're like whoa whoa what did I do wrong oh my god I'm sorry I hurt you and and not necessarily he didn't do anything wrong to me I was triggered in the moment that's not his responsibility um I didn't put that on him you know I just said take them off you know and, and we took them off and I sat down I was just like whoa that really you know brought something up in me that I didn't know existed and you know and I actually felt bad I was like I'm sorry for scaring you you know but I was scared in that moment too um so yeah there's all these you know things that go on in this world you know you have to be mindful of yeah when you're dealing with another person there's a lot of nuance involved I was especially in something intimate like that where you guys are you know participating in this thing right and there's this understanding between you and then you know you don't know what's going to spark like you like that like yeah. you don't know what's going to spark something inside of somebody right in a negative way right and then yeah what happens from that like you just got to be careful i right. guess is what it sounds like and, and be per you know I, i've taken a lot of classes and a lot of times they don't teach that in workshops like being careful yeah well about like what to do if something goes wrong i've learned how to tie up cock and balls i've learned how to condition someone to uh orgasm on command um you know i've learned all of Have these you, that, that is crazy <laughs> there's there's yeah there's i mean i know how to do all of these things but it's not really a lot of times we don't talk about like what happens when you trigger somebody, you know, how they don't talk a lot about what's what we call aftercare. So it's like you've beat somebody for like hours and now what? Well, you don't just like, well, that was good. Uh, safe drive home. No, you kind of have to like bring them down. You know, you want to wrap them up in a blanket. You want to give them some water. You know, you want to talk to them if they need to talk about what happened. Some people require a lot of aftercare. I require very little. I'm like, I'm good, dude. I want to go watch the scene I hear going on over here. I'll check in later. Um, some people... There's uh, this bottom drop, top drop, where people come down, you know, a day's... Sometimes days later, you've had this great experience. Um, you're just reeling from it, you know. All of these, uh, you know, hormones and peptoids are going off in your mind and your body. And you're just high for like three days. And then all of a sudden you crash. You like wake up one day and you're like crying. And you don't know why. And you're feeling depressed and blue. And, you know, not everybody knows that like that's something that happens. And it doesn't necessarily happen one day or two day. I'm a three-day dropper. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out. It took me a while to be able to communicate with somebody of like, I'm going to be fine, but on Wednesday, I need you to call me and check on me on Wednesday. 
And I have to communicate that to my partner. I have to know myself well enough, um, you know, and it should be part of the negotiation. Okay, I want to spank you. I want to tie you up. I want to ball gag you. You know, I want to do all these things. And then what do you need from me? How do you like your aftercare? What can I do for you in the end? Um, I've outsourced my aftercare. I have played with somebody and said, okay, at the end of the scene, I'm going to give you back to your partner. And they are going to provide the aftercare, you know. And I'm going to go do other things. So, yeah, it's 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 a thing. There's a lot of things to take into consideration. I think sometimes people think, oh, we're just going to go in the bedroom and pull her hair and slap her ass a little bit. And, you know, which is fun. I mean, that's fun, too. You know, you should try that. Yeah, I didn't think about the psychological effect effect of that right. right and how that could it's almost it almost sounds like ecstasy right where you have that you have that drop right and you gotta you have to watch out for that right right do you are more people trying to talk about aftercare like obviously you are are promoting that but is that on more people's rate like do people just not know about it or i well i think yeah, those of us i think in the community are probably right. pretty well versed there kind of becomes this thing of like Sometimes we forget people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like training somebody on the job, you know, and you have all this stuff in your head and you just know and you've done it a hundred times and that's just, you know, part yeah. of it. And then you skip over things because you forget yeah. they don't know. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. And, you know, probably in our community, it's just common knowledge, you, you know. Um, when we teach the classes, I talk about, you know, how to negotiate a scene and, and part of that being negotiating the aftercare afterwards. Um, it, it's something that can easily be overlooked. People get excited, you know, about negotiating a scene and um, maybe gloss over the aftercare. Or you can negotiate and say, I don't need any aftercare. And then you do, you know. I mean, everything's subject to change. Uh, you don't always know how you're going to feel afterwards. You could be exhausted and crying, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've been in scenes where at the end of it, I'm bawling, you know. Um, and other times I'm laughing the whole entire time, you know. So I I don't – I can try to predict how I might feel, but we don't know, you know. Yeah, you're not really going to know until you're in that experience, mm -hmm. I guess, huh? Yeah. When you do these fetish nights, are you getting any pushback from anybody? Are people pretty accepting and like, okay, I want to like I've check this out? I've got no shit. Oh, that's cool. It, which is really interesting because I've done a lot of other venues um, and uh, like um, I've, I've been part of the LGBTQ community and, and um, helping with the festivals and stuff around here. And um, I've, I've gotten more shit from doing stuff like that. But yeah, ne never, never. Never got it. Five years. We did Fetish Night for five years at Siren Song and never got really any shit about it. Wow. I, I Surprising. I know. I, I, I was always, like, waiting for it. I mean, there's been some times where there was, like, some shit that, like, it, but it wasn't about the kink. It was more about, you know, people's, like, behavior in the bar or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, you know, it wasn't about uh, our, our, us facilitating what was going on. You know, I mean, there's human dynamics. Yeah. But, yeah. No. Yeah. It was well, easy. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I know. I, I was always, like, waiting for someone to, be like, be outside with some Jesus sign or something like, like that. Like you're at Planned Parenthood, right? Yeah, you've got, you know? You've got everybody staying outside. Yeah. yeah. Don't go in there. Don't go in there. You're going to be corrupted. Yeah, yeah. The devil's going to take your soul. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. I wonder if that's – I mean, people up here seem to be pretty pretty accepting. Yeah. Like, on the, on the open side. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem – it doesn't seem bad up here. No. Well, that's good. I think, I just think that if people, whatever people are interested in, you should be allowed to pursue. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, like who cares? The pursuit of happiness, right? That is the American dream. Yeah. You know? And yeah, as long as you're, you know, not a harm to yourself or, or to anyone else, you know, do whatever you, yeah. you want. Yeah. And what people do, that's what I don't get. What people do in their own homes right. or in their own dungeons or wherever they're Mind your own fucking business. <laughs> that's that's the moral of life. Is is that that's a key thing, and you're gonna be happier that way if you right. do. Right. Yeah. And and you know, and I get it. People, you know, there's people out there that's like, I can't believe you know. We so one of the sayings we have in our community is, "Don't yuck on someone else's yum." You know. Great expression. And it it we don't kink shame people. You know, of like, I just don't understand why you would ever want it. That's fine. You don't have to understand it. You have to just respect that it's what I 
like and and want to to do or whatever you know and we do our best to i i do my best to facilitate any desire that someone would really want i have had you know the privilege of of just about doing everything on my fuck it list so it's like one of those like people come to me and they're like i want to experience that and i'm like oh let me tell you how you know and, and stuff and so i you know even if it's not something that turns me on or excites me you know but yeah i'll you know i'll help you i'll give you tips and tricks or try to send you somewhere you know that where you can learn more information Point you in the right direction. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good. And I mean, I think, again, going back to just people talking about things, right? Is yeah. when you when you have an open dialogue. That's right. why I was so happy when you came on because it's like I have no idea about anything in this community, <laughs> but like I would just like to talk. Like I don't know. Like I didn't have any preconceptions about where this conversation was going to go. I was just like I. This is a world that I'm not part of. Like I would love to just hear about it and talk to you. So with. what are you going to do differently now? You're gonna go <laughs> not definitely not ball gagged and I mean I'm I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say I'm vanilla but I'm definitely not on that level but I can appreciate not yet. that like that's uh, I think <laughs> I wouldn't place money on that wager but I just think that's like I just I think that's cool like if people are doing that right. and are happy and are having a good time like that's right. awesome yeah. that's whatever you find that makes you happy in life is a good thing well thanks for providing a platform for us to talk about Thank it you for and being coming open on. to you know the idea of having a conversation about it yeah that's i if the discourse is is the most important thing to me it's yeah. just open dialogue and you're so friendly and fun like i was like <laughs> oh this is this is awesome okay <laughs> Uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. Do you have any idea when you guys are gonna come back to no, Sirens? No, no. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just so it's just so hard right now. I, and it's one of those things. So like, you have a venue and you have to plan ahead, mm. and it's impossible to plan ahead right now. Yeah, like because everything's changing. I, constantly. Well, yeah, yeah, because like we thought we were gonna have a fetish night in September. I had a tentative date. I had a venue, you know, and and we were talking about it. And before, like within weeks of having the conversation conversation of like let's do this you know like it all went to shit so it's you know and fetish night isn't any fun unless there's lots of people there I mean that's what makes it great is the crowd it's it's about you guys it's about them I'm not you know it's not about me mm -hmm. I mean I can show up with all of the toys and everything but if no one wants to play it's not a game you know so it needs to be it there needs to be people like there you know you need that crowd dynamic it's yeah it's it's part of it it's it's just so yeah we we just live we live for the people so yeah, it's really hard, you know, because then it's like, well, we could throw an event, but if only 20 people show up, that's going to be kind of boring. I mean, don't get me wrong. You'll get a great, really long spanking, you know, and, and stuff like that. I mean, it'll probably really benefit the 20 people that show up, you know, but then if there's not a lot of people... The pack mentality, the more people that do something, the more that want to do it. So if you have, you know, it's like going to that high school dance where everybody's standing on the wall and it takes one person to get on the dance floor and then pretty soon other people. And a lot of times at fetish night, I've had to have my staff spank each other. I'm like, you guys have to spank each other. So like people will know. Like, to ease everybody into yeah, it. Like, yeah. You know, and then. And then the, someone, oh, not me next, you know. So um, nobody wants to be first, but everybody wants to join in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know when fetish night's gonna come back. You know, um, I'd I'd rather wait and and have it done and and done right and 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 all of that stuff and you know. We went out with we we just had such a good reputation and everything was really good, and even if we never come back, I'm really satisfied with everything that we accomplished in the time that we were there. You know, and I don't know what the world holds. And even for all of my like staff, it's not just about me. You know, it's about finding. You know, it's a it's a dynamic of other people. So I have to get a team together. I have to get a crew that wants to, you know, carry this on too. So we'll see you know lives are changing people are doing different things and moving away and you know it's it, which has been the evolution here you know and i hope that if i don't bring back fetish night that you know maybe someone else will you know birth something pick up the torch yeah you know and create something of their own and you know i'd be happy to you know give advice and and you know help them facilitate that too so yeah we'll see what happens time one day at a time that's all you can do yeah
Well, I'm excited to see what the next day brings then. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> I think that'll be cool. I miss it. I miss spanking people. Yeah. I, I, I miss seeing people get spanked. You know, I miss I miss all of that excitement. And and my people miss it. You know, I know that people we're so starved for um, affection and attention and touch right now. You know, so I think bringing Fetish Night back would be super beneficial to a lot of people in, in that manner alone. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to see it come back. Yeah, well, I hope you guys do. I hope. And then you can come. COVID, yeah, I hope COVID settles down and you guys can get get back out there. That'd be great. Yeah, I think yeah. that would be really cool. Yeah. I haven't even done private parties. And I usually do a couple private parties a year, but I won't even let private parties happen. Just to play extra safe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even if it's like 30 people, I'm like, no, no. Not, yeah. Yeah, it's just not, we're not there yet. So. Well, hopefully we we get there. Hopefully everybody we can start turning the turning the page on covid. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Get back to whatever comes next. Right. All right, well Naughty, thank you so much for coming on. I had <laughs> I had a blast talking with you. I definitely learned a lot. Yay. Um it was that was just a lot of fun. Awesome. I really I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, maybe you'll have me back and next time you'll have like more questions. Yes. You know, oh, you I'm can... full of questions. Yeah. 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 I'm going to have to mull over this and be like, "Okay, Naughty, we, we got to do a round two. And, right, and, right, and wait, wait, wait. You said this, and I want to yeah, know more. I, I, it took me a while to process all this, but I think we're ready for for the next. Yeah, we'll definitely have to have you yeah, back on. I'd love to. And I can bring, uh, you know, some of my other members in here, too. They'd probably, you know, maybe maybe I'll get one of my guys to come in here, and you can hear a male perspective. Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'd like to hear what they have to say sometimes. Yeah. So I can scold them and humiliate them. No, I'm just Oh, kidding. perfect. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, guys.